guys, I am so excited about this. Please pay very good attention. I know this is going to be a great experience. Some of you guys might be the ones out there. So think about, it's a great way to think about our future, about what we want to do. If you're here, it's because you're special and you're capable of doing anything that you want. Anything. So just remember, the sky is not the limit. You can go further. Okay? So please, I'm going to go ahead and have Dr. Rita introduce our special guest, Dr. Rita. Dr. Rita used to be my boss. Does anybody remember Dr. Rita? No? No, no, she's been gone for a while. Okay, here you go. Good morning. I'm sorry we're late today, but there was a delay in Houston with the weather. You know, the weather in Houston's always crazy. I thought, I don't care what the weather is, this astronaut has been through worse. He, can get, he would get here, and sure enough, he's here. And he's all excited to see you. All the way over here, he wanted to learn about Stell Middle School. Where's Stell? Thank you. You know, I went to Stell, but like a very long time ago. Where's my friends from Manzano? There you go. Thank you so much. And of course, I graduated from, from Pace High School, so I love coming here. <laughs> What an amazing opportunity. Uh, this is partly sponsored by Texas A&M University System. Uh, you have an astronaut who's got incredible experience, traveled all over the world. I'm gonna let you tell you about his life, but I'm, not, I'm gonna hold off on the intro to let him entertain you and, and speak to you about careers in, in NASA, careers in STEM, careers in science, and the wonderful opportunity that each of you have to make a significant difference in your community. So with that, Dr. Michael Lopez Alegria. Astronaut. Buenos dias. A lo mejor mejor que lo diga en inglés, pero quería en, empezar para decir que yo nací en Madrid, yo soy español, de padre de España, madre italiana americana. Y Yo cuando, teníamos, cuando tenía yo un año y medio nos fuimos a vivir a Estados Unidos, empezamos en Boston, luego al sur de California. Mi padre era militar, no hablaba ni palabra de inglés, no tenía un trabajo, o sea, como militar no había trabajo que podía eh, traer consigo aquí y tuvo que empezar desde cero sin hablar el idioma, sin tener trabajo. Y poco a poco, cuando se retiró como ingeniero eléctrico de una fábrica de aviones, donde luego yo pude, pude volar en su avión, me pareció algo muy bonito. Eso para decir que yo comparto un poco el, el, mi sangre española, mi sangre latina, con ustedes. Vamos. I don't want to come in English. Is it okay if I do Spanish? I mean English? Okay. Yes. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. So, this is not me. This is a guy named Buzz Aldrin. He walked on the moon in 1969. I was 11 years old when that happened, and uh, it was a pretty magical moment for me. And that's sort of when I, try, I decided that I wanted to try to become an astronaut. And after going to school uh, at the Naval Academy, becoming a Navy pilot, then becoming a Navy test pilot, getting a, a graduate degree in aeronautical engineering, I was accepted to uh, the class of 1992 um, at NASA. We were about 24 people, um, five of them from other countries, 19 Americans. We had about 10 pilots five scientists, uh, four medical doctors, and four engineers. And the first thing you do as an astronaut is you start training. And uh, the space shuttle was the vehicle that we were flying back then, so we had to learn all the systems, you know, like your car has a radio, and it has an engine, and it has an air conditioner. All those are what we call systems. The space shuttle had about 25 of them, and we learned each system one by one, how it works, how it was designed, how you used it uh, individually. And then we did the same thing by um, going into a simulator that put all those systems together. So this is the cockpit of the space shuttle, but this is actually a simulator, can't tell. It uses real flight hardware and real flight software. Um, and we got to start using the procedures first, normal procedures, you know, launch, entry, landing, et cetera, and then the same um, profiles of flight, but with things that were 
the things that would go wrong. So this, the instructors would input malfunctions and we would have to go through the procedures to fix this, et cetera. And the better we got, the harder the malfunctions were to solve. So this is a simulator from the outside. You'd agree that it doesn't really look like a space shuttle, but it moves in all six axes. So rock, roll, pitch, and yaw, and it, um, it can simulate the motions. And then it's a little bit like uh, VR, where you have the, the scenes are projected where the windows would be. So when you're inside, it feels just like a simulator. But it can't simulate zero G, and for zero G, which is the lack of gravity, let me back up because you're in school and this is important. When you're orbiting the Earth, some people think that you're weightless because you see pictures of astronauts floating, and in fact, they are weightless. But it's not because there's no gravity. There's almost as much gravity at the altitudes at which we orbit the Earth as there is here on Earth. But the difference is you're falling, you're in free fall, so imagine you go to the tallest building in the world and you get in the elevator at the top floor and for some reason the elevator cable breaks and you start falling down toward Earth. Well, while it's falling and you're falling inside it, it would be fun for a couple seconds till you get to the bottom. In, in space, that lasts forever because you're basically going so fast that you're falling around the Earth. And in this uh, airplane, it does what they call parabolas. And for about 20 or 25 seconds, you get to have this sensation. By the way, is it possible to bring the lights down a little bit? I think the images will be a little clearer. So we also fly a different kind of airplane. This is a NASA T-38. It's a high-performance, two-engine, supersonic jet, which flies two people. And the reason we fly this is not, some of us are already pilots, but many people are not. Um, they are scientists or engineers or medical doctors, like I said. And it's helpful to get them in the cockpit to wear you know, uncomfortable stuff like an oxygen mask and a helmet and a, um, a um, ejection seat harness, et cetera. And we get to work with each other as crew members because teamwork is extremely important in space. When you can uh, rely on somebody to help you solve a problem, that's what this really does for training. So we go from flying several thousand feet into the air to a few tens of feet underwater for training to do spacewalks. This is a giant swimming pool. It's uh, 200 feet by 100 feet by about 40 feet deep. And in it are mock-ups of the space station, back then the space shuttle, the Hubble Space Telescope, pretty much anything that we worked on in space. So you wear pretty much the same spacesuit. It's not exactly the same because the backpack system where you breathe your, your oxygen from and that kind of thing in space is replaced by a, a hose, an umbilical. But you get lowered into the water and you start working on stuff. And it's important because um, in the water we can simulate zero G to some degree. They can add or subtract weight from your suit to make it be neutrally buoyant. So you don't sink, you don't float. And then you can go do the work. Now you start thinking about things. What, what kind of stuff do we do on spacewalks? Well, we, a lot of the trades, so like plumbing and metal work and electricians, you know, we attach cables, we remove bolts, we um, detach and attach hydraulic fluid lines. But it's a little bit different because in 1G, if you have a big bolt and you put a wrench on it and you turn it, you know, pretty much the wrench is gonna turn. But if you do the same thing in zero G, as you put pressure on this thing to turn, it's probably you that's gonna start turning the other way. So you have to think about that kind of stuff and this is where we do that, that initial training. We spend about six and a half hours uh, during a normal spacewalk and to practice that spacewalk, we spend about six hours in the pool. So it's a pretty long day. But at the end, we always have a support team with us, two um, uh, safety divers, two utility divers, and we're talking to everybody constantly. So it really, again, brings out that sense of teamwork, which is really important. So we do some other kinds of training. We actually, we're not doctors, but we have to learn how to do some medical stuff. So if you're uh, like, about like an EMT, an emergency medical technician that would ride in an ambulance, that's the level of training we get. So we can stitch you up if you cut yourself. We can pull your teeth if you've got a bad tooth. Um, no, nothing too drastic, but we do have to learn a little bit. 
The thing on the right is the robotic arm on the space shuttle. We learn how to, uh, sorry, the space station, but there's one just like it on the space shuttle. We learn how to uh, operate that. We learn how to take a lot of pictures. So one of the biggest hobbies up there, as you can imagine, is taking pictures of the Earth. Uh, but we also take pictures for science, so we have to be very adept at using different lenses, different cameras, etc. And of course, we have to learn how to live up there. You know, cooking is different, eating is different, sleeping is different. I don't need to tell you to go into the bathroom is different. And in fact, we have a trainer how to go to the bathroom in space. I don't think I need to get into any details, but it's a little bit different. You don't have gravity. Gravity is your friend in some cases. So, all that happens in the first year uh, as you're an astronaut. You're actually not really an astronaut. You're an astronaut candidate. They like to call us ASCANs. But once we finish being ASCANs, we are eligible to be assigned to a flight. So, first of all, we spend some time uh, in a technical assignment, you know, waiting for our turn. And then, usually about a year before flight, the crew will be named to a, a space shuttle mission. So we do a lot of that same kind of training again, but this time it's more specific. It's not sort of generically how does a space shuttle work, but how does a space shuttle work when we're trying to do this particular mission. And the spacewalks that we're doing are particular to the assembly of the ISS, at least in my case, which is where I got to do my spacewalks. And finally, um, we go into quarantine. Go into quarantine because you don't want to be getting sick, at, you know, right before or worse, right after you launch. And so we try to get isolated from uh, people who might be carrying germs. Not a big deal. It's usually about a week long. Three days of it is here in Houston, Texas, and the second three days are in, uh, in the Cape, at Cape Canaveral in Florida. And this is us arriving, you know, overhead the uh, space shuttle that we're going to launch on. Pretty exciting moment. So in the meantime, while we've been doing all this training, the technicians down in Florida have been putting the space shuttle together. It's a big machine that's got lots of different pieces. Um, the first pieces that are assembled are the two white cylinders on each side. Those are called solid rocket boosters. They have a fuel oxidizer mix that's about like a pink, well, people may not use pencils anymore, but Normally, at the end of a pencil is an eraser, right? That pink rubberish eraser is what, the, uh, is what this fuel looks like. And those two cylinders are filled with that. The thing about solid rocket propellant is it's a bit like a firecracker. Once you light it, you can't control it. You can't turn it off. You can't throttle it. You, it's it's going to just burn the way it goes. So a lot of thrust, but also a little bit hard to control. We also have liquid engines which are on the very bottom of the space shuttle, and they're fed by liquid fuel, which is in the great big uh, oblong orange tank, which is in the middle. Two kinds of fuel, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Normally, oxygen and hydrogen are gases, right? So if you cool it down enough, just like you take, um, if you boil water, it turns into steam. Well, that's because the boiling point of water happens to be at, you know, 212 degrees. Well, the boiling point of oxygen and hydrogen is below room temperature. In fact, it's way below room temperature. So the, the liquid oxygen and hydrogen are extraordinarily cold, and they're inside that tank. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, and the, the reason it's orange is because it's covered with this insulation, which is sprayed on, and the insulation kind of rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, I mean to air. So. Last day of quarantine is over. You get up the morning of launch. We have this ceremonial breakfast. Nobody tends to eat very much because you don't want to have a really big st full stomach. People tend to get a little queasy when they get to space, so the less you eat, the better. Same thing with drinking, because we actually wear a diaper when we launch. But nobody, if you ever tried it, and I don't recommend this, but laying in bed, l lie down on your back, which is the position you'd be in for launch, with your feet up, as if you were sitting in a chair, and try to go to the bathroom. It's really hard, and it's really uncomfortable. So we do that. We get suited up. This is a launch and entry suit. We put a, It's basically one piece. Um, put shoes over the feet. You put gloves on. You put a helmet on. We pump it up, make sure that no air can get out, because we don't want air getting out if we ever had to use this in a bad day. 
And then we go out to the, uh, this, I mean, uh, silver van, which is uh, basically like an Airstream trailer, and we drive about 15 miles out to the pad. When we get there, there's only six people there, uh, oh, sorry, six, seven other people besides the seven people on the crew, and those are the guys in white, and they're called the closeout crew. And their job is to get us safely in the vehicle, make sure that the hatch is closed, and then prepare this thing called the white room, which is what I'm standing in. The white room is on the end of the orbiter access arm, which is basically like a bridge that goes out to the, the hatch on the space shuttle. So they put us in one by one, as I mentioned, you're on your back. They connect the uh, oxygen lines, the water lines for cooling, the electrical lines so we have uh, communication with each other, and then they leave. They close the door and they retreat to a point three, th uh, three miles away because if something went wrong with the space shuttle, that's like the closest place to be safe. So now we're inside, it's about two hours before launch. We gotta make sure that all those switches are in the right position. It doesn't take very long, actually. Uh, and then we get a little free time, you know, sort of chat with each other. Some people actually take a nap, but nobody takes a nap when we're in the final part of the countdown. And at nine minutes in the countdown, the clock stops. So we have this thing, it says nine colon zero zero, and it stops. And then the flight director, a guy, uh, I'm sorry, the launch director, a guy on the ground does what they call a poll of all the people that are responsible for all the systems on the space shuttle and on the ground segment that are being monitored for their health. And one by one, after being called by, not their name, but by the name of the system, they say go or no go for launch. And we can actually hear all that as they say, you know, system A, go, system B, go. They actually ask the crew, like the crew's gonna say, no, we don't wanna go, right? And at, at that, after that, the launch uh, director says, the count will resume on my mark, three, two, one, mark, and the clock goes from 900 to 859, 858, and you know when that thing gets to zero, something pretty exciting is gonna happen. So that's the um, white room that I mentioned. At seven minutes and 15 seconds to launch, that whole thing, the structure rotates out of the way, and you can see the windows, right? So we can see that thing moving. At uh, six minutes and 15 seconds, we start the uh, auxiliary power unit. So these are little rocket engines that actually pump hydraulic fluid so we can move the big surfaces uh, on the space shuttle and also the nozzles of the big engines on the bottom. Then at four and a half minutes, they arm what they call the range safety system. And this is a system that Astronauts don't really love very much because what would happen is if the, the uh, ground safety guys see that the shuttle's trajectory is going in the wrong direction, they could actually press a button which would destroy the shuttle. So we make sure we go shake hands with that person right before the launch to make sure that you know they look into our eyes and know that we're humans. So then we start these uh, s series of aerodynamic surface checks. So remember I was talking about the hydraulic fluid. So the big elevons at the back of the vehicle start moving. You can feel those things shaking. Same thing with the engine bells. They start moving. This is all pre-programmed and expected. Then at the very top, you can see the, um, well, you'll see it better in the film, but there's a, a hood that moves out of the way. It was sitting right on top of the orange tank. And that's because, as I mentioned, at room temperature, oxygen boils, and it basically turns in steam, and they want to capture that because it's pretty flammable. Two minutes, 30 seconds, we're inside. They say, close and lock your visors, initiate O2 flow. 31 seconds prior to launch, all of the uh, functions of the launch sequence get handed off from the computers on the ground to computers on the space shuttle. 16 seconds prior to launch, a whole bunch of water gets dumped onto the launch pad and that's to absorb some of the acoustic vibration and to dampen it out. 6.6 .6 seconds prior to launch, the first of the three main engines, which you see here on the bottom in sequence, starts to light and then at 120 set milliseconds, so 1.2 seconds each after that, the other two go in order, so that the whole, all three engines are at full thrust a couple of seconds before launch. So what's holding them down, what's holding the spaceship down is that the, the um, as you can see, the two cylinders on each side, at the bottom they have 
uh, four bolts each that are bolting the whole structure to the launch pad. And these bolts are big, like that. And these bolts have nuts that have explosives in them. And so sure enough, at T0, this is what the bolts look like. There's an explosion there, the nut fractures, the bolts slip out, and at the very same time, the solid rocket boosters, the fireworks, light, and off you go. So this is a pretty big acceleration. The vehicle weighs about four and a half million pounds. The thrust is about seven and a half million pounds. So that is the G ratio that you feel, meaning the acceleration. So if you've ever been in a fast car, this is way faster. So it's like somebody jumping on the accelerator, you get thrown back in your seat. There's a lot of vibration coming from those solid rocket boosters. You're doing the best you can to you know, look at the instruments and make sure that everything's going right. But mostly you're just having fun. By the time you get to this picture, you're going 100 miles an hour straight up. And at this picture, you're burning, each of those solid rocket propellant, I mean, uh, boosters is burning nine tons. So that's 9,000, sorry, 18,000 pounds of propellant per second. So remember I said seven and a half million pounds of thrust, four and a half million pounds of weight. Four and a half million number is getting smaller because you're burning the propellant. And as a result, the acceleration's increasing, right? So you're getting pinned back even more and more in your seat. And it's pretty fast acceleration. By the time you get to two minutes, you're going four times the speed of sound. We don't talk about miles per hour, we, per hour but speed of sound is about six and a half, 650, 670 miles per hour. We're going four times that fast at two minutes. And the solid rocket boosters are empty, so the thrust goes way down, but so does the weight, because those things are, are pretty heavy even when they're empty. And then the acceleration just continues. By five minutes, 20 seconds, we're going Mach 5. I'm sorry, at three minutes, we're going Mach 5. We're going Mach 10 by five minutes, 20 seconds. Seven minutes, 10 seconds, we're going Mach 20. And by eight and a half minutes, we're going Mach 25. It's about 17,500 miles an hour, which is fast enough to stay in that orbit and make that free fall. And then we get rid of the external tank and we're in space. And attention all personnel, this is the entity conducting the launch status check. Verify ready to resume count and go for launch. OTC. OTC is go. TBC. Tank and booster go. TTC. TTC is go. LPS. LPS is go. The countdown clock will resume on my mind. I'm so sorry. I must have advanced. Stand by. We'll do it again. Steering check and work. 20. Firing chain is armed. 15. Go for main engine start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. So that's a pretty amazing ride, and you can imagine it's a little bit like a roller coaster. And uh, at, at eight and a half minutes, when the engine's cut off, 
Remember the acceleration I talked about? Well, then it's like somebody slams on the brakes uh, and everything starts to float. And you go from that crazy roller coaster to this beautiful, peaceful, tranquil, quiet sensation of floating in space. And the best part is, well, first of all, it's kind of entertaining to see people's hair flying around. Um, we get unstrapped and out of our launch and entry suits, and then we, uh, we can look out the window. So we see this amazing different array of colors. This is a, a Pacific, an atoll, an island in the Pacific Ocean. These are uh, the sands of the Sahara Desert in Africa. This is a volcano erupting uh, in Sicily. These are glaciers in uh, Patagonia in the southern uh, South America. So I went a little bit too fast. This is, uh, these are actually lightning storms. So when you see lightning, it's like way stuck down to the earth instead of being above you. Same with meteorites. We see meteorites below us instead of above us. We're at an altitude, by the way, of about 400 miles. So not that far. Um, but everything, everything that we know in the atmosphere is probably within the first 10 miles. These are aurora. You've probably heard of aurora borealis and aurora australis. These occur near the poles. This is a hurricane, probably you're something a little more familiar with than you'd like to be. This is a sunset. Sunsets, we go around the earth 20, uh, 16 times in every 24 hour period. So uh, every 45 minutes we get to see a sunset or a sunrise and it's spectacular. It goes pretty fast, but it looks really, really neat. These are cities, so what's interesting is you see all this beautiful colors and the landscape and the sort of beauty of nature, but what people are really drawn to are these gray smudges that end up being cities. You can't see this detail with the naked eye, but you take out one of those long lenses that we practiced in the, uh, in the training, and this happens to be Washington, D.C. This is pretty neat. This is Boston in the wintertime. You can see the snow, but stuff like the lines, uh, the runways on the, uh, on the, um, at the airport, and long bridges, those things that are very, very straight, you actually can't see with the naked eye because, you know, Earth doesn't really, nature doesn't really look like that. It's very straight. So I was able to do uh, 10 spacewalks during my career, which is by far the best part of the experience. Um, as flying into space is 100 out of 100. Doing a spacewalk is like 150. It's just unbelievable. And, and what's different about it, I mean, beside the work you're doing, you, you do have to do work, but it's hard not to look around, is you stop looking for cities. You look at the, like, the big picture of nature, you know, the, the, sit, the sites that you might be familiar with. This is Spain on the right, and straight to Gibraltar in the middle. And what's really cool is at night, which as I said, only lasts 45 minutes, you can really start to make out the continents and stuff just by knowing where the cities are. You get good at that after a while. But even better than looking at the Earth when you, at night when you look away from the Earth, you get to see this. So we're all used to seeing you know, a black sky with a couple of dots of white. Up there, it's, there's only so many stars. I mean, when you think about it, we're not any closer to them really. But the point is that there's no light, right? You're not around any cities or anything. And so your eyes can perceive these stars that are out there. It's quite spectacular. <clears throat> uh, just real quick, this didn't happen in space. This is a <laughs> Columbus three ships discovering America. Um, but what I wanted to illustrate with this is it's usually um, the role of governments to go and expand new frontiers. Columbus discovered America, um, Lewis and Clark in the westward expansion in this country. And then when the governments get there and they sort of establish security and, and maybe the possibility for trade, for some commerce, then government kind of gets out of the way and lets merchants come in and do their thing. So that's what's happening in space now. I'm, I'm kind of transitioning from my career to what, I, what I'm really doing now, now that I left NASA, and that is advocating for commercial space. So you might recognize Sir Richard Branson, upper left, Elon Musk, upper right, Jeff Bezos, lower left. These guys all have space companies <clears throat> that are, some of them are right now carrying cargo to the International Space Station, but their rockets and their vehicles weren't developed by countries. They're developed by people. 
And the reason they can do that is because with this uh, computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, these processes which were so difficult to get right and had to have very exotic materials and super skilled labor, now you can do them with machines and the repeatability is better, the precision is better. And so this is a revolution. This is kind of turning uh, space exploration upside down. A couple of these guys, the two on the left, want to fly humans to, on suborbital flights. So you don't get to go as fast as I mentioned, but you do go as high almost. You go up to about 60, sorry, 80 kilometers, um, sorry, 80 miles, and you come straight down. But for a while, you get to see A, the curvature of the Earth, a little bit of the views that we saw, and B, you get to be weightless, not for 20 seconds like in the parabolic flight, but for four or five minutes. And then, Elon Musk on the right wants to do orbital flights first for NASA passengers but also later for commercial passengers. So at some point we're going to see what happened in the 1930s when we had airplanes that were super expensive and only really really wealthy people could fly as passengers. Now people get on airplanes fairly routinely to go to you know birthday parties and weddings. So that's what I believe the future is and I'm excited that a lot of you believe it or not, are going to get into space one of these days. <clears throat> we also have to have a place to go once we get there. This is an artist's depiction of a commercial space station. You know, we have the International Space Station that's on orbit today, but it's not going to last forever. So there's actually a couple of commercial companies that want to build one of these. And I guess the last thing I want to say is that flying in space is an adventure. It's an amazing experience, but more than anything, I think it gives you a different perspective perspective in the literal sense of the word because you see the earth differently um, in, a, in a very privileged position of being you know 400 miles above or 250 miles 400 kilometers above it uh, but a perspective also because you know from space um, things look pretty peaceful you don't see uh, wars you don't see conflict you don't see hunger you don't see disease you don't see borders, right? This is not the map we're used to seeing with all the lines between the countries. This is the Middle East, a very uh, conflicted region. But you don't see that. And you think to yourself, why can't we sort of be nice to each other and understand each other a little bit better? And you also see the fragility of the Earth. You see this very thin atmosphere, which is all that protects us from all the vacuum and radiation and bad stuff that's going on in space. And you realize that we need to protect it. And that whole change of perspective is called the overview effect. And that's why I really want, I believe, in democratizing access to, pay, to space. So people like you that can only imagine what they would be like will one day get to experience that. You'll have this overview effect. You'll believe in sort of this brother and sisterhood of humanity. And I think the Earth will be a better place. And I believe that's all I have to say. So how much time do we have? 10 minutes. Would anybody like, did anybody like to ask a question? Don't be shy, it's always the first. Pace High School, I was just going to ask, how long did you have to go to school? I did do a year of graduate school, and then uh, after graduate school, I did do a year of test pilot school. So those are the blocks that kind of have to be checked. A lot of astronauts are um, are PhDs, so they had even more schooling. But I'm going to go back to what I just said at the end, which is that you don't have to be a government astronaut. You can just be a regular person that loves their job so much that they do well at it that they earn enough money to be able to buy a flight into space. Now, if you want to be an, a government astronaut where you don't have to buy it, they actually pay you, then at least today you have to study uh, science, technology, engineering, or math discipline in an undergraduate school 
and you can apply to be an astronaut. My name is Julian Alonso Raya uh, from Pace High School, and I just wanted to know uh, how much time will you serve like as an astronaut for NASA? So probably one of the hardest parts of being selected is, is uh, physical, the flight physical. And it isn't that you have to be Superman or, or an athlete or anything, you just have to be healthy. And so what determines the length of your career is generally your health. There's no upper age limit. You could leave after one flight. You could stay you know, until you're 70 years old. You just have to be able to pass the annual flight physical. So it's kind of up to you how long you stay. I stayed 20 years. I flew four times. And uh, that was enough for me. And you know, I'm doing something different now and letting the, you know, the younger guys do it. But, um, I have colleagues that are older than I am that started before I did that are still there. Hello, I'm Pritika from Pace. And you were talking earlier about how you had to be quarantined before the flight. How do, do you like not see your family? Like how does that, how does that work? So you know that running the microphone back and forth is part of your other duties as a sign, right? <laughs> um, so what happens is your, your immediate family gets a, a physical exam also to make sure that they're well. And if they're past the physical exam, then you can have normal contact with them. However, they don't allow contact with children less than 16 years old, because some of you guys carry a lot of germs around apparently. <laughs> And so my son um, was, a, you know, like a year and a half when I flew, and, and I didn't get to see him. But um, other than that, you know, you can, you just say goodbye to him a week ahead of time, and, and that's it. Anybody else? Way over there. Why don't you shout out the question? I'll just repeat it. You have a lot of children here. What's your name? Caitlin. Yeah, so the question was whether we just take pictures of Earth or whether we definitely, or we have specific missions. So I would tell you that taking pictures is more of a hobby. So we only do that in our, in our spare time. We're actually quite busy during the day. So my first space shuttle mission was about two weeks long in the shuttle's cargo bay. We had a laboratory module and we had a crew of seven people that was divided into two shifts. So one shift was always working in the model, module while the other shift was asleep. And in the module were science experiments in material science, uh, fluid physics, combustion science, and biotechnology. So we did experiments the whole time. The second and third flights were missions to assemble the International Space Station. So typically we would have uh, some element, some big piece in the, in the cargo bay. We'd go up to the space station, we'd rendezvous, we'd dock, we'd use the robotic arm of the shuttle to take the element out and attach it where it was gonna go, and then we'd go do spacewalks to make all the connections of fluid lines, electrical lines, et cetera. And my last flight, I was living on the space station, so instead of being two weeks, it was seven months long, and during that time, about a third of my time was sort of ops and maintenance of the space station, a third of it was also construction, because it was still growing at the time, and the other third was doing science experiments. So fundamentally, the reason that we go to space is to take advantage of this apparent microgravity. So as I said, gravity's there, but we just sort of take it out of the equation. So if, you, if I let go of this microphone, it would just float in front of me. What's cool about that is when you take that force away, you can study minor forces like put some uh, water in a glass, if you look closely at the edge of the, uh, of the water where it intersects the glass, you have this, th this thing called a meniscus. That's because of a force called surface tension, which is really overwhelmed by gravity. But when in the absence of gravity, surface tension uh, has a lot to do with fluid physics. So if you had a, a, 
a, a glass of water in microgravity took the glass away and all you had left was a water, you would be, if you leave it alone long enough, it'll end up being a perfect sphere. And that's because that is the shape that minimizes this surface tension. So that's the kind of thing, if you light a match in space, it doesn't burn with the flame, the shape, because the reason it has that shape is something called convection, right? So hot air rises. That allows oxygen to come in, you know, it's basically a, a cycle of oxygen feeding the flame. In space, a lit match is actually spherical, so it's perfectly round, and, and it, brins, it burns very dimly because the oxygen flow is only from diffusion, which takes a lot longer, so it's a really, it's hard to light a fire in space, actually. So that's the reason why we do. The ISS is, is basically a big laboratory to study microgravity. Shout. I can. What convinced me I wanted to be an astronaut? Yeah. Well, it's two things. I mean, as I said, I, I was inspired by the Apollo landing in 1969. I'll never forget it. I was uh, on the beach with my family in Southern California, you know, playing in the water like the rest of the kids. And all the parents started calling the kids out of the water. Nobody really knew what was going on. And we started uh, listening, like we were huddled around our blankets on the, on the, on the sand, listening to, does anybody know what a transistor radio is? So. It was a radio, small, and we could hear what was going on. These guys were approaching the moon, and I swear that even the wives, the wives, the waves kind of quieted down so we could hear these last few seconds. And after that moment, I'm 11 years old, right? I'm looking at all these adults, and they're hugging each other and slapping each other in the back like they were all related, and they didn't even know each other. It was like this great moment. So that was very inspirational. Now, I'm not gonna lie. Um, when I went to high school, I wanted to be a lot of other things, too. I, I wanted to be a baseball player, I wanted to be an architect. But I ended up going to school at the Naval Academy and ended up becoming a pilot, and sort of all this stuff started coming together. And when I was 25 years old, I wanted to, I'd studied engineering at the Academy, and I wanted to combine being an engineer and a pilot, so I decided to become a test pilot. I was reading an article in a magazine <clears throat> about the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, and there was a sidebar about all the people that had graduated from that school that had gone on to become astronauts. So if the dream was born in a, at 11 years old, it was sort of reborn at 25. And from that point on, you know, that became my focus. Yeah, so the question is about how, how your, uh, I guess, relationship with your feelings about being launched changed from the first mission to the fourth. Yeah, oddly, I think I was most comfortable on the first. I don't know if I'd say comfortable, but I was uh, less worried about myself on the first because I was more worried about making a mistake. You know, I was so, you know, this is my first flight. I didn't want to let anybody down. And, you're super excited, first and foremost. I mean, people who are in those seats have been trying to be in those seats for a very long time. So the time for fear is way in the rearview mirror. It's all about excitement. Uh, but as you get more and more used to what that is like, of course, you know, you sort of think about, well, I'm sitting on 750 tons of TNT, and they say that when you light a rocket, 10,000 things can happen, and only one of them is good. You, know, you start doing that math. Um, but I, I, I think that my last mission, so I launched my last mission not on the space shuttle, but on a Soyuz, which is a Russian vehicle, and that for me was like the first time again. I was a lot more concerned about, you know, understanding what was being said and, and being on top of the game. Um, so I, I, um, I don't think it changed very much over the four times. If anything, it got a little easier and then maybe got harder at the end. <laughs> 